Hey, this is Edwin Dearborn, another edition of Growth Driven, where we're bringing to you experts on, well, like the show says, drive your growth. And today with me is best-selling author, John Warlow, who's going to talk about his books and how to build your business so that you can sell it big time. Hey, John. Uh, first of all, I really want to thank you for coming here on Growth Driven. I found you on Amazon. I was looking for authors. I've seen your book before. I think I may have even purchased it and started to read it. So this time I'll definitely read it all the way through. But what intrigued me is you just came out with a new one. And I really wanted you to speak to our audience about what I feel is such an important topic, how to build your business so that one day you can sell it. Yeah, it's a big it's a big topic for sure. And I think the the word could is important because a lot of business owners, they don't actually want to sell the business, but they want to know they could sell. Mm. And I wrote this book as you referenced like probably 10 years ago now called Built to Sell. And it had a bit of a life of its own. I got I got a chance to speak to audiences of entrepreneurs, not many these days, but before the pandemic. And you know, it's funny, one of the the things that I found in the questions that I would get or had nothing to do with the content of the book. The book is about like, how do you build a business that could thrive without you? How do you put systems in place and et cetera? And like the questions I would get from the audience in these speeches would be like, like, how do I avoid an earnout? And you know, <laughs> all these things that are more about the mechanics of selling. And yeah. so I started a podcast five years ago called Built to Sell Radio, where I interviewed a different entrepreneur every week and asked them, what was selling like? What did you learn from it? And so five years later, I came to learn that there was a cohort of my guests on the show that punch well above their weight when it comes to selling. Like Instead of trading at multiples of EBITDA, they're trading at multiples of revenue. And so I got to thinking, maybe I should put together their ideas into some sort of action plan that other owners could follow. And that's the new book, The Art of Selling Your Business. That's awesome. Well, being a student uh, many years ago of Michael Gerber. Oh, sure. Yeah. He brought up that point of like, you know, if you build it to sell, whether you sell it or not, you're, you're building a better business because you've got that vision in mind. Yeah. Yeah. It's absolutely right. I mean, Michael Gerber is kind of the grandfather. All of us, <laughs> in some way, have a lineage to Gerber and, and the book, The E Myth. That you know, I actually had him on my show, and oh, right. uh, he was a great guest years ago. But in any event, the idea of building a, a business that can thrive without you is what Gerber referred to as working on, not in your business. And that's really the the kind of principle is for your business to have transferable value, for it to be worth something to someone else. Effectively, it's got to run without you. And the inverse is obviously true. If, if the business is, is very deeply dependent on you, what you'll typically get in the way of an offer uh, is either an earnout or what's referred to as a VBT or vendor take back, VTB, excuse me, vendor take back or seller financing effectively. And, and both of those sort of solutions to selling your business have some pretty significant risks to them. So what you're trying to do is, is get your business to not be dependent on you. Makes a lot of sense. So let's say, you know, a, a, probably a typical person that comes to you or reads the book is, it sounds like an attractive idea. I want to get there one day somehow. Obviously, they have, you know, lack of know-how, self-limiting ideas, you know, and or many other factors. What do you find are kind of the two or three or four key aha moments or breakthrough moments that get them actually going in that direction? The big one is that we're chasing the wrong goals. So as an mm -hmm. entrepreneurial community, we celebrate growth. It's the it's the most incredible thing. I mean, it's the name of your podcast. It's the, right. it's the essence of what we all sort of focus on. Top line revenue. And, and it's... It's also a problem because oftentimes owners will grow to the point where they're chasing revenue but not value. And so the, the adjustment I would make in terms of being growth driven would be to focus on building your value, not necessarily your revenue. There's an old expression that revenue is vanity, profit is sanity. 
I like to change that and refer to revenue is vanity, value is sanity. And so that sounds kind of esoteric, but to give you a more practical analogy, what I like to tell owners to think about is that instead of chasing their top line revenue number, their goal is to grow the children in their basement into young adults. We all as parents can kind of kind of equate to the idea that an adolescent needs our coaching to get out of the house, right? To mm -hmm. be successful on their own, they need to live on their own. And much the same way, I think entrepreneurs would, would be well served to think about their job, not to reach some revenue target, some arbitrary top line number, but to think my goal is to grow this little human being and this little business that's right now really dependent on me. My goal is to to, to basically bring them into the universe so that they can live on their own. And that's a that's a fairly big change for a lot of people's perspective that they see that. themselves as a parent. I could see that. I think, you know, unfortunately, our society accentuates the big number. Yeah. As the big goal, like I want to be a millionaire. I want to have a million followers on Instagram. It's somehow something magical happens if we hit that number. But I think a lot of people chasing the number versus the value, as you say it, there's a burnout and there's almost like a lack of satisfaction or a major sacrifice to get there. And at the end, they're not happy. Yeah. I mean, look, we it's how we introduce ourselves at cocktail parties. Oh, I have 14 employees. I have 26 employees. Oh, we hit a million. We had 5 million. We like these mm -hmm. are markers that we use to validate ourselves, right? The Inc. 5,000, 5,000 fastest growing companies. EO, you got to have a million in sales to get in. We use these top line revenue numbers as a way to sort of see who's the most important, you know, biggest dog in the room, so to speak. And I think it does us a disservice in particular around value. I'll give you two examples, two stories from my podcast which resonate because I've just done episodes recently. One guy built a $15 million business, one $5 million business, tremendous success from the outside, right? Employing lots of people, growing really quickly, a uh, very exciting business. However, it was very seasonal and it required him to put a lot of cash into the business every year because it was so seasonal that he run into these really deep cash wells where he had to put lots of money in the business. He ended up selling the business and he got about 25% of one year's revenue. Compare and contrast that with a guy named Rob Walling. Rob Walling, I interviewed recently, built a little company called Drip, email marketing software he sold to lead pages. This is a company that no one really knew about. They had 12 employees, very small company. They mm -hmm. had $2 million of annual revenue, not $15 million, but $2 million. Long story short, Rob was entertaining offers of between 9 and 12 times revenue. Absolutely crushing the fifteen million dollar business because he's focused on growing not just top line revenue but growing value, which mm -hmm. is a very different way to approach building a company. Okay, this is I love that I love that comparison because it it really demonstrates that the big number at the top that ev that's visible to everybody isn't the actual value of the company. No. So when you say building value, I mean, uh, you know, one of the things I say in one of my books is value is one of the most misunderstood and misused words. It's it's just like, you know, Walmart, get more value. Right. Value is. Yeah. And when you're just drop, I think we had an internet drop there. So you're saying Walmart, get more value. And then I lost you. Okay. Sorry about that. So how would you define value? Like you're sitting down, you're consulting somebody or you're interviewing them and they go, okay, uh, you're right. Not profits value. How would you, how would you um, define that for them? Yeah. Effectively, the value of your company can be determined in three different ways. One, the book value, which is essentially just your assets. Mm -hmm. The second would be your market value to a financial buyer, which really is looking at your stream of profit in the future. So to make your business more valuable to a financial buyer, it's really about reducing the variability, making those profits bulletproof, very predictable. And then there's the strategic buyer who places a value on your business, not about not for your future stream of profit, but what 
your business is worth in their hands. And that's a very different calculation. Let me give you an example. I, uh, I interviewed a woman named Stephanie Breedlove for the book. She built a little $9 million payroll company. And I say little, not in a pejorative sense, but just to reinforce, it was not a huge company, right? It was a $9 million business, built it over 25 years. They did payroll for parents who had a nanny to pay, hmm. right? It's the only kind of payroll they did. Just if you had a nanny to pay, they would be the company for you. Because at the time, ADP and paychecks couldn't be bothered with you know one parent who has a nanny to pay, right? They want to do tens and thousands of people. So right. she carved out her little niche, $9 million business. Well, she went and decided she wanted to sell it. And instead of looking for a financial buyer, she looked for a strategic. And she identified care.com. Care, of course, is like the, the Angie's list of care providers. You plug in your zip code into their search and it'll pop up all the care providers in your market so you can find a babysitter for your kids. Well, they had 7 million subscribers when Stephanie Breedlove approached them. Stephanie, her $9 million business, had 10,000 customers. So Breedlove makes the case to Care and says, look, if 1% of my of your customers, your 7 million subscribers buy my service, that's 70,000 customers, right? Wow. Like that's a business seven times the size of my business, right? Now let's let's imagine 2% were to buy or even 5% of your 7 million subscribers. And that's how Stephanie Breedlove sold a $9 million business for $54 million. Wow. Again, I to a financial buyer, it would have been worth a fraction of that because they would be using a different math. They would be using discounted cash flow, effectively looking at her profits and discount it back to present day. But Stephanie wanted a better multiple. So she looked to a strategic acquirer for whom they valued the business with, by, based on what it was worth in their hands. Yeah, that's, that's actually a mind-blowing concept because yeah. again, people look at just the numbers of the here and now going, okay, it does 9 million. The profit is X. Our standard formula is we will pay you one and a half times. You know, it's all calculated out of some textbook, but your third example of what is it worth to that brand mm -hmm. in their hands to their audience now the multiple is you know three times greater or four times greater than it would be traditionally to another type of buyer. Yeah, it can be. It can be. And again, the savvy negotiator is the one who who makes that case. Um, you know, every strategic buyer is going to want to pay what a financial buyer will pay, and every seller selling to a strategic is going to want to get a piece of the strategic value, right? And the yeah, strategic yeah. is going to say, "No, no, that's ours to enjoy." And the savvy right. seller is going to say, "Just give me a little slice." Like Breedlove, if you think about it, didn't get all of the strategic value; she got it just a little slice. But because Care has seven million subscribers, a little slice was fifty-four million dollars worth. Yeah, yeah. So now, obviously, this begs the question, hey, I want to build a business from the ground up with all of this stuff that you've just told me in mind so that I'm premeditated, not, oh, I've built a $9 million business. Oop, it's it's worth $50 million. Who would have known? That was, she got, I'm not going to say lucky, but she, it was fortuitous without her really planning for that to occur. Mm -hmm. Right. She didn't sit there and go, I'm going to build a $9 million company that I'll sell for 54 million because there's this company out there with all these subscribers and that's how I'll, that's how I'll become a multimillionaire. So how do you, do you recommend that people take all of these strategies in mind well beforehand and kind of build that value in? Yeah, look, yeah, I, I think you're, you're absolutely right. I don't think people should you know, build the flip. There's a pejorative, you know, saying in, in Silicon Valley where, we, you know, you get in and you get out quickly and you kind of, you know, rape and pillage. That's not what I, I advocate in any way, shape or form. I'm suggesting yeah. that you build a business that can thrive without you from day one. And when mm -hmm. you take that lens on your decisions, it can make different, you can make different decisions. You can build a business that doesn't depend on you. And then you've got the ultimate poker hand, right? In the game of life. If you've got a business that can thrive without you, you could sell, but you could eat just as easily bring in a management team. I just did an interview. It went live this week with a guy named Greg Carpenter, built 
uh, a great business called Sales Benchmark Index, SBI. And he had this view from the very beginning that he was going to build it so that it was not dependent on him. In fact, he didn't even have an office space. He had everybody work from home because he didn't want the you know the traditional kind of Christmas tree org chart where all the managers kind of hold up and all, everybody working from home. Built it up to be totally reliant on the team, not him. So much so that when he went to sell it, his management team negotiated the entire sale of SBI. He never met the buyers. Now, that sounds interesting if your company is a relatively small business. In the case of Greg's business, he sold a $30 million revenue, top line revenue business for $162 million without ever meeting the buyer. That's what I'm talking about when I mean building a business that can thrive without you. When you can sell your entire business without ever meeting the buyer, you've, you've nailed it, right? And that's that's how he got you know six times revenue for a consulting business, which should trade, again, around one times. That's incredible. Yeah, that would be the knee plus ultra of I built a business and I didn't even have to be there to sell it. Which, I mean, to me, like, look, I've done 300 episodes of Built to Sell Radio. That's the first time I've ever heard somebody actually sell without meeting the buyer. So, I mean, he gets the, the whatever, the gold star for building to sell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He gets a special award. Yeah. Okay, so so um, typically, in, let's say in the last three to five years, who are the people that are drawn most to what you do? Are there particularly industries or a personality type that are drawn to you that go, this is exactly where we want to go? Well, I think what you want to do is you're starting to approach the end. And most most people, I think, listening to this are probably going to be five or 10 years away from selling, right? Like maybe the, the notion of the idea that maybe they want to sell is out there, but they're probably not you know, actively marketing their business. So that's a great time to be thinking about these concepts. I think what you want to start thinking about is who are the natural strategics? Who in your industry is the care.com for your industry, right? Yeah, Looking true, out true. in the industry that you're in and, and trying to identify them. And then looking at the companies those strategic acquirers have bought in the past because they typically have investment theses or investment strategies. And you'll see this where they're rolling up companies and they you want to make sure that your business looks like one of them. I'll give you an example. I just had I just did an interview with this this week, a guy named Jeff Feldberg, who built a company called Embanet. Embanet helped universities and colleges put their courses online. Hmm. And you're, I mean, this is a big deal now in a pandemic, but prior to that, it was he was one of the earlier players in this whole e-learning space. But in the beginning, he kind of talked about Embanet as a web design shop right? And, and, and he got an offer to buy his business. And the offer was for three times profit. And he, is a, he and his partner, Steven, said, ah, it's kind of, a, kind of a ho-hum offer, right? Like it's not horrible, but it's certainly not you know, uh, a huge offer. And so he decided to make some changes. They made a shift to the business model and they went out and changed the way they talked about their business in the public from being a design studio or web design shop to being a leading provider in the e-learning category. Hmm. And everything they did from their website to their SEO to the way their brochure, the way their sales people spoke was we're the leaders in the e-learning category. And Harvard and Boston College and Vanderbilt University use us for their e-learning strategy. I see. Two and a half years later, he accepted an offer of 13 times EBITDA. In part, I believe, because they change the way they talk about the business yeah, and yeah. making sure it sounds like, positioned like the kind of company acquires or want to buy. Yeah, great point. I think that's that's a lot of times what I see is, you know, you, you see somebody that's kind of boxed into a certain type of identity. They're not very creative. You know, you could say we're a mortgage company or we're I'm a real estate agent. And I, I had a gentleman on the show a few days ago. It sells barbecue grills. He's got it's barbecuegrills.com. And you know, it, you look at it, you think he just sells, he sells the actual equipment to build one of these, you know, luxury barbecues. Uh, you know, 
And he goes, I don't, I actually don't sell barbecues. What I sell is I sell memories and experiences. <laughs> That's great. Right. So everything that he does from the photography to the description of, you know, the um, barbecue grills to even the branded content that he's creating, it's all built around the experience of friends and family having these amazing times around the barbecue versus here's the barbecue, here's the cost. Yeah. Get it. I'll ship it tomorrow. Right. Yeah, benefits versus features, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. I think that's, I think that's a great example. And I, I would, I would also go a step further and say, if he could kind of productize or brand and, and maybe Edwin, you're helping him with this, the, the, the whole way he talks about his solution, he, he all of a sudden gets himself out of being compared with other vendors of barbecue grills and, yeah. and, and now he's got the solution which he can kind of own and price and, and differentiate himself on yeah the whole system i'll definitely send him this video when we're done <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh tell me you, this is your third book mm -hmm. um t t just kind of briefly tell me about the earlier two and what they were about and then how it led to your third one Sure thing. So yeah, Built to Sell is about how do you create a business that can thrive without you, a valuable company someone would want to buy. Mm -hmm. The Automatic Customer came out in 2015. It was about how do you accelerate the value of your business through recurring revenue, one of the eight drivers that's kind of the secret sauce for jacking up the value of your business. So okay. Built to Sell about building the value, Automatic Customer about accelerating the value. And then the art of selling your business is about how do you harvest the value you've created? So what do you do to actually go about and proactively negotiate the sale of your company and punch above your weight? Because for a lot of owners, you know, there's something called the five to 20 rule where it states that the natural buyer for your business is somewhere between five and 20 times the size of your company today. And so if you think about it, that means that by definition, people listening to this will be effectively in a David and Goliath battle, right? And they're yep. David and they're negotiating with Goliath. And so what I try to do in the book is, is kind of give them some secrets for creating leverage, even though they're not as big or as well resourced as the big guys, there's some tactics you can, you can use some ways that you can lever up your leverage, if you will, to get a, a better deal and, and punch above your weight. That's awesome. So if you're just joining in on the podcast or the video version, because uh, I do upload this to multiple podcasts once it's uploaded to YouTube, is I'm with John Warlow, uh, The Art of Selling Your Business, which you can get on Amazon and I'm sure Kindle as well. Um, or you can go to his website to find out about his books. You also have some online courses uh, at builttosell.com. So you have online courses, you have your books, uh, and I, I would assume that you offer some type of consulting or uh, assistance. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, my day job is I run a software company called the Value Builder System, where we have a way that we help entrepreneurs improve the value of their business leading up to an exit. And nice. we license that software to advisors, coaches, consultants around the world who use it as a, uh, a practice area in their firm. Nice, nice. Okay, so you've got the software to empower coaches, consultants around the world to use your principles to help take Their that to the yeah. next level. Okay, yeah. great. All right, awesome. So, um, and then, so now when the pandemic ends, or in, or when we, you know, calm down and we're allowed to go out and speak again in public, what, do, what are your future plans to go out and 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 sell and talk about your materials, or are you going to just stick with the podcast? Yeah, look, the podcast has been fun and it does give me reach for sure. I don't know about you, Edwin, but I, I do miss getting out and, and, and kind of pressing the flesh and being with people. So I get, you know, I, I get uh, an opportunity to speak to a lot of EO groups, if you're familiar with the organize, entrepreneurs organization. And, yeah. and so I love, I love those kinds of things. So I'll, I'll be doing some more of that hopefully soon when we can, uh, we can all get out in the world a little better. Yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to it. I mean, you know, I live in Las Vegas, Nevada, and, and our town is built on conventions. They think it's gambling. And I no, said, no, no it's, it's conventions. Yeah. It's conventions that drives this town. So it, it's been really tough on Las Vegas. And yeah. so for multiple reasons, not only for myself to go out and speak, but just, you know, I just want to see my hometown do well. For sure. Bring back 
the tourists bring back the conventions and you know revive our economy so i'm looking forward to that okay great so um if 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 someone was to sit down with you and go hey uh i am five or ten years away i'm going to give it to my kids or i'm going to sell it or whatever where what would be step number one like I, i get into it i get all excited what do i do today or this week to propel myself in that direction yeah figure out your pull factors so when it comes to having a business, you're going to have push factors and pull factors. Push factors are things that push you away from your company. They're the frustrations of running your business, right? Okay. Angry customers, employees who are too demanding, you know, whatever, red yeah. tape, government, <laughs> blah, blah. Yeah. Those are all push factors. And we all have them. Every business has them. Pull factors are the things that you want to go do next. Um, the really exciting things that give you inspiration. So that could be writing a book. It could be traveling. It could be starting another business. What I would start and tell any entrepreneur who's kind of listening to this and saying, yeah, this building to sell idea kind of resonates with me. I would get a piece of paper, a pen out and really, really do some deep thinking on what your pull factors are, what you want to go do next, because the happiest exits are the ones where they're going to something. Let me give an example. I interviewed a guy named Sean Oshman. He's still the most successful, most popular episode of, of my podcast. He ran an IT consulting business based in Denver, Colorado. Very ordinary business, a couple million dollars in revenue. At the age of 39, he kind of had an epiphany moment. And he said, you know what? I, I'm kind of done with Denver. I want to live on the water. I actually want to buy a boat, sailboat, and, and, and live on the water. Yeah. And, and so that was his 39th birthday. He said, by my 40th birthday, I want to be on the water. So he goes down to a business broker and says, look, I need you to sell my company. Broker comes back and says, sure. They do a deal and he sells for around two and a half times profit. So it's not a, it's not like a Stephanie Breedlove kind of exit, right? Like it's an, it's a pretty average kind of thing. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I talked to Sean and I kind of put it to him. I said, you know, like that's a, that's a successful exit, but it's not a huge number. And he said, yeah, but you're missing, you're missing the point. And I, and I was like, what? And he's like, I, I live on a sailboat. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 it was I'm just a, yeah I'm happy right? I'm, 40, <laughs> yeah, right I'm living with my fiance on a sailboat you know right, right and and so I think that may be a bit too kumbaya for what you were hoping me to answer that no, question for no. but but I think it's I think it's really important to figure out what your pull factors are because then. I think the heavy lifting associated with, with building to sell, putting this, some of the things that we've talked about today in place, it, it all is a payoff in sight when you've got uh, a really galvanizing pull factor. Yeah, I like that. And I'll tell you where I like that because I think a lot of people sell the business as an escape from mm, yeah. versus a, a purpose towards and when you've got that purpose towards something, that happier moment versus just get this business out of my life. So, so because he's just because it's like he's trying to avoid the push factors, right? Yeah, he just yeah. wants to get he wants to detox. Yeah, yeah, and it, look, it, it's stressful. I mean, as you know, I mean, you've seen it in in your own world in 2020, the pandemic, and uh, you know. It, it's it has been a, a crushing year for a lot of small businesses. Absolutely no crushing. No question. And and I think what we're seeing is is a lot of business owners say, you know, I'm out. I like I want to capture the value I've created, yep. but I don't need to get the next zero. Like I I just want out. And I, I reminded a guy I interviewed was um, Joey Redner. Uh, he built a company called Cigar City Brewing, little craft brewer based in Tampa, Florida. And he kind of was a beer guy. What's that? Ibor City? Is it in Ibor City? I no, I think it's in Tampa Bay. I I don't know that area terribly well. It could be because you know uh, Ibor is kind of. I was there a couple months ago with my kids, and it's kind of the cigar capital of America. Oh, that's maybe I'm just that's where it comes from. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I never okay. asked him. I didn't know that reference, but uh, but I interviewed him. And I said, like, tell me the story. He said, well, I built this thing. And to start it, I borrowed 600 grand from my dad. Uh, and, and he lent me the money and that got me up and going. And I was a success pretty early on. Like I sold out in all the bars and so quickly demand outstripped 
the ability for me to manufacture the beer. And so he had to build a bigger facility. He hadn't paid off his dad yet where <laughs> he went and borrowed a bunch more money from the SBA yeah. uh, in order SBA you know, guaranteed in order to get the next facility built, built it up 20,000 you know, barrels a day or whatever. I can't, I don't have any clue about Brewer, but soon after that, a couple of years after that, a third time he ran out of capacity and they said, look, I need you to build more. You know, like the, the market was saying, look, we need you to build more capacity. And he said to me, John, I felt like I was a gambler at the Vegas poker table. Yeah. And I just went won five hands in a row. And the dealer looked at me and said, put all your chips. We're going again. <laughs> and, and, you know, Redner was being asked for a personal guarantee. He hadn't even paid his dad back. He's got this money. And he just said, enough. Like I've done what I wanted to do. I've yep. created a successful business. It's got value. I want to sell it. And I don't think there's anything, there's no shame to that. I think we are uh, to some extent socialized to think, oh, you're selling out and you're, you know, you should build to last and you should have a vision that's 50 years. And I, like, I don't buy into all that thing. I think most of us as entrepreneurs have a, have a shelf life, right? Is it five years? Is it 10 years? I don't know, but it's a short period of time where we can create and after that, to be honest, in many cases, we're, our businesses are better off without us. Yeah. And here's the other thing. If you're on a sailboat with your fiance and you're happy, then who cares about the other zero, right? Right. Yeah, exactly right. And I think Redner, Oshman, both of those guys are examples of people who kind of got it right. And, and both, by the way, are young guys. Like, I don't, Joey Redner might be 40. Uh, he, Oshman, he do, you know. another gig. Yeah, absolutely. And probably will, you know, yeah. and, and that's the thing. I think one of the things about selling a company, which is, which is so cool and it's not, it's what, you know, God, there's so many, there's so many downsides of running a company, right? And we've experienced many of them in the last couple of years, but the one upside is that you can take your foot off the career ladder. If you go to work at Microsoft you know, you, you become a manager and then you've got to become a senior manager and then a director. I mean, there's a very linear path, right? And if you take your foot off and say, I'm just going to leave for a couple of years and go do something, you're done, right? Yep. Yep. Whereas entrepreneurship has that wonderful quality. Once you've learned how to effectively create value through entrepreneurship, you can create something for five years, take a couple of years off, go do another business for five years. There's nobody that's going to tell you you can't. And, and I, so I think we'll, we haven't seen the end of Oshman or Redner. They'll be back doing something else. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. It's got their first foot on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Like they're never going to worry about where the next sort of meal is coming from. Like they've, they've checked that box. And so they've, 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 uh, they've done themselves a great service. I think. Yeah. I, I think what happens is, is guys like that. My observation is, they really win. They get to the point, like you said, it's got a shelf life. They hit that shelf life. They go to the sailboat. And then after about two or three years, they get tired of the sailboat and they want to, because their, their, their mind is just thinking about the next, you know, I want to get back in the game. You know, you, you can see that struggle in athletes where their body just can't take it anymore and they have to retire and they're there announcing their retirement they're crying like a baby right because they're gonna walk away from the game they love but you know there's a few guys like um you know that that really go from football or basketball or baseball into this into the announcement world or the business world fran tarkington mm -hmm. um, you know, what's his name uh, with the Broncos? John Elway. John Elway, Aikman. A lot of the quarterbacks go on to have tremendous, you know, career yeah, broadcasting and so forth. Yeah. yeah, the broadcasting or they start, you know, whatever. They start a brand. Of, Bobak, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, they probably walk away in tears. And then a couple years later going, I'm going to have 38 Pizza Huts, you know, and I'm going to work with Shaq and we're going to sell a boatload of pizzas, right? Yeah, yeah. So, I think those kind of guys come back, but they now have the experience and the win. Um, John, it's been, I, I, I'm going to have you back on the show in about That's six great. months. You're very articulate. I can tell that you've, you've, you've delved deep into the minds of a lot of experts by these stories you've sold. And guys, if you're, if you're listening to this or watching this either now, next week, next month, or a year from now, when you find it on YouTube, 
um, I want you to get his books. I know that I'm going to go get mine again. The first book I now remember, I did get Built to Sell. Hmm. And I'm going to get that again. Go to builttosell.com and get John Worlow's books. He's got software. He's got courses. You know, peruse his website. See what he has. John, I, I really want to thank you for taking the time. This is a passion project of mine, growth driven. And, you know, it was, it was one of those moments during COVID early on that I wanted to create, rebrand my show and reach out to people like you to, you know, as we said, many businesses were devastated. So I had that purpose of going, well, if I could bring on experts and we could undevastate them and help them with some insights, then I felt like I was part of the solution just as versus watching the world burn down. Yeah. Well, thanks for letting me be a small part in the uh, the growth driven story, so to speak. Yeah. All right, guys. Thank you again for uh, joining us here on Growth Driven and uh, hope you enjoy the content that we have brought to you and will bring to you in the future. You make it a great day and be safe and do well out there. Bye-bye.